Happy New Happy Year! Happy New Year! Hey, Hello, Kelly. Happy everyone. New Year. Yes, it's the new year. That's it's 2023. Right. Three. I, I'm losing count. I'm losing count too <laughs> it's like, because it's like the years right. are all running together and everything. And this one went really fast. It, it did. It seemed it like did. it went really fast. Yes, yes, guys. Right. Like, like if if you think the year flew by, like do like do like a fast emoji or something. Do yeah, like a running just, man or something. Because if you got to <laughs> slow the roll. That's right. <laughs> yes. And so um, I don't know if you got a chance to join us last night, um, but we had a New Year's uh, service. It was amazing. Yes. And by Encore. Yes. Yes. You were going to check it out to get, uh, today. If you did That's not get right. to check it out last night, we we're going to check it out today. It was awesome. 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 And a great word. Great word to start off the year, and so yeah. we, we want you to be aware of that. And guys, yeah, and light up the chat, y'all. I want to hear from you. Like, light yeah. up the chat. Even if you're watching on your TV or something, you can just hop on the chat thingy and just, like, just be like a like a little picture or something. And not only that, share it. Share yes, it with friends and family. Guys. I think this is this is a good message to share with mm -hmm. your family at the top of the year. Yeah. And just to encourage them. It's a good habit to have for 2023, too. That's right. So, guys, check it out. My God is faithful. a declaration that Moses said over the children of Israel as they were entering into the promised land. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 8. It says, the Lord himself will go before you. He will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You don't have to be afraid and you don't have to be discouraged because the Lord himself will go before you. So I don't know what 2022 looked like for you, but you have a promise from the Lord today. You have a promise from the Lord today. You yes. have a promise yes. from yes, You Lord. have a promise from the yes, Lord. from the Lord today that he the Lord himself will go before you. Let's give the Lord a praise. Yes. Oh, come on put your hands together. I try with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting without a hope. And just when I deny what I see, no choice but to believe, my doubts are burning, like ashes in the wind, so so long to my old friends, burning in bitterness, you just keep moving, hey, you're not welcome here.
story's not over, it's only beginning. Your story's not over. He's still writing chapters, he's still writing chapters. Your story's not over. Your story's not over, it's only beginning. Your story's not over. God has the final say. Just give God praise right now. Come on, just thank God. Thank him, thank him for this new horizon, this new year that's coming forth. Come on, just open your mouth and give God thanks. Lord, we thank you. We're so grateful for you. God, we respond in a hallelujah. We respond in worship because you're so good.
agree with you, God. We sing amen. 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 Come on, just sing that word out. of years, the Christian community gathered on New Year's Eve, and it was called watch night service, because we would watch into the next year as the clock changes and the new year comes, and there was an eruption of celebration. So when we meet tonight, this is historical, this is something that's tradition, but it also has life to it, because what we're saying is that Jesus... We want to enter into the new year celebrating you, worshiping you in the house of the Lord. Come on. That's what we're saying. That's why we're doing this. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I've been, we've been doing this in this building since 1994. Uh, so it's a long time. A long time. And one of the things, yeah. Some of you weren't even born yet. You know, me too. <laughs> but one of the things that we know is that when you come at 1030, you didn't come here for a church service. You came here for a party. You came here to serve the Lord, to worship our God. You came to celebrate our God, right? Good, good, good. That's why we're here. So I want us to just ask the Lord to do something amazing tonight. Would you with me lift your hands to the Lord? It's, it's a sign of a surrendered heart. God, do something amazing tonight. Set our hearts on fire. Capture our hearts afresh. Help us to enter into the new year different, changed, transformed. And let this change be deep change where it can't be reversed. Help us to leave this building and for those watching online to leave our, our screen, our TV, our laptop, our cell phone, whatever device we're using, God, help us when we turn it off that something has been ablaze in us, that our hearts, like Jeremiah said, our hearts are on fire for you, Lord. 
Father, we ask you these things in the mighty name of Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. Father, we thank you. We thank you. Just take a moment now, just visit with the Lord. So madly in love with you. He so wants to use you. He longs to break off a few of the things that hold you back. He kisses you with his kisses. He shines upon you his righteousness. He lavishes you with his affection. He sets his eye upon you. You're the apple of his eye. The one who he died for. He's the friend who sticks closer than any brother. He's the bright morning star. The lily of the valley. The rose of Sharon. The son of righteousness. The lamb of God. He's the one who you serve. Right now, right here, Jesus is inviting you into a personal relationship with him. Right now, right here, he wants to forgive you of everything. Right now, right here, he wants to give you a brand new start. Right now, right here, he wants to welcome you into his kingdom. Right now, right here, he wants you to make a decision. Do you want to experience a new life? All across this building, in the balcony, those watching online, right now, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. It's simple, but the impact is powerful. Jesus wants you in his family, and he wants to forgive you of all of your sins and cleanse you. If you are away from God in a backslidden state, your hearts become cold towards the Lord. Right now, right here, he wants to set you free. If you have never before invited Jesus into your life to be your Savior, right now, right here, he stands ready to receive you. I want you to pray this simple prayer after me quietly in your heart to experience the gift of his great forgiveness. Here we go. Heavenly Father, there's nothing I can do to deserve your forgiveness. But right here, right now, I want to receive your forgiveness. Wash away my sins. Change me. Help me to walk with you every day of my life, starting right now, right here. I ask you these things in the name of Jesus, my Savior. Amen. 
If you just prayed that prayer with me and you meant business with God, I'm going to ask you right now just to throw your hand up to say, yeah, I pray with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to just let you know what we're going to give you before you leave this building. And for you watching online, there's instruction in the lower part of the screen that you can follow. There's this little packet. It's in a gold-colored folder. It's titled The Next Step. Don't leave this building tonight without it. If you're in the balcony or the lower level, at every exit door, there are men and women that have a bunch of these packets in their hand. It's our gift to you. It'll answer a lot of questions you have. I don't want you to leave without getting one of these. Just wave at them, motion to them, and they'll make sure you get one. All right? Welcome to the family of God. Welcome. Welcome. Okay. Would you turn to someone, smile at them, and tell them you're in for a treat tonight because the Holy Spirit is here. Please be seated. Well, welcome to our New Year's Eve service. I'm Pastor Lionel King. <laughs> just aged a little. <laughs> Got a little tan. I just say. <laughs> but welcome. <laughs> welcome. It's a joy to be here. It's been a while since I've been here, a couple of months. But uh, it's such, it's, it's just like, it's, it's home. It's family reunion time. And so I really appreciate that. If you're a guest to our church, thank you for being a part of our evening. And we'd love to connect with you. Would you pull out your smart device, whether a cell phone or an iPad, and then open up the camera app. And I want you to zoom into the QR code that you see on the screen, and you'll immediately get a, a link from us. That means that we've made a connection, but follow the prompting on the link, and then you'll be able to let us know about you and then learn more about us. But suffice it to say, we want to walk together for a while so that we can help each other grow in Jesus. But it's our joy to have you here tonight. Now, I want to just draw your attention also to the big screens because there are a couple of things going on at our church, and we want to bring it to your attention. So let's take a look. Happy New Year, family. Happy New Year. Um, we've got some new stuff going on. That's right. Always got a lot of stuff Okay, going well, on. there are some really, really new things, and they are happening right now, so watch this. Check it out. What is life really about? Are my habits helpful? Are my values anchored? Can I really change? Is my purpose clear? In the end, when it's all said and done, what really matters? accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Today is your day. This is the moment in time before you go into 2023 that you can find new life. What role does God want me to play in caring for the poor and the marginalized? See 
this. Yes. It, it's so exciting to see all that God did in 2022. And it's because of your faithful giving to the Lord that made this possible. So give yourselves a hand. Yes. I'm so thankful. You know, tonight, is, and today I should say, is a day of thanksgiving. And as we give our New Year's offering, it's an offering that says, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness towards me this year. You know, giving is, is an act of worship and thanksgiving. As a matter of fact, in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29, it says, Give unto the Lord the glory that's due his name. Come into his courts with an offering of thanksgiving. And so this is a day and this is a time when you can say, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness towards me and my family this year. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for, for providing for me. Thank you for healing me. Whatever it is that you can be thankful for, this is your moment to show God your gratitude in your giving. And so at this time, we're going to receive our tithes and our offering. You can follow the prompting on the screen for a safe and secure way to give. Or you can give the traditional way by using the offering envelope that's in the pew in front of you. You can make all your checks payable to Christ Church. I want to encourage you to finish well this year in your giving. It's, it, it marks a time where you're uh, you know, you're going to say, you know, I'm going to give my best gift and I'm going to sow a seed for what I'm believing God to do in my life in 2023. All right. Are you ready to give church? All right. So let's pray over your gifts. And so father, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness towards us this year. And we give you this offering as an act of gratitude for your goodness. And we ask God that you'd receive it. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless your people today. May uh, they ex reap a harvest in 2023, exceedingly and abundantly above all they can ask or imagine. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The ushers are going to come at this time and serve you and receive your gifts.
Would you tell the worship team, thank you for sharing with us this evening. Thank you guys for your faithfulness over the year. We really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you for your consistency. And for all of you men and women that serve you know, in children's ministry and teen and, and all the ministries that we have, the ushers and the media, really appreciate your, your giving of yourself and your serving the people of God and being faithful. We have a tremendous group of men and women and young people that serve the church over the course of a year. It's not episodic, they're consistent and they're faithful and they do it out of the bigness and generosity of their hearts. Would you give them a round of applause please for what they do? And I know we don't, we don't say it enough, but I want you to know that it's, we're honored to serve alongside of you. Are you ready for the word? Good. Would you bow your heart with me please? I want to pray with you. Father, as we open up sacred scripture, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would go to work in each of our hearts, chip away junk, pain, hurt, coldness from our hearts that we may be on fire for you and go into 2023 ablaze for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I title my topic today, The Year It Happened. Imagine if you would look back 10 years from now to 2023 and people ask you all the way in 2033, when did you get so powerful? When did you get so on fire for God? When did you develop such a healthy family? When did you have such a robust faith? What was the turning point? And then you'll answer them. The year it happened was 2023. I came to preach to you today. It's not going to be a systematic teaching. I didn't come to give you a lot of head knowledge. I came to get you fired up for God. That's my assignment. I want to encourage you to lean in this year because God has something for you. And I want to encourage us as a faith community to lean into God this year because I believe this is the year that's going to make the difference. I want to spend our time in the book of Nehemiah. It's one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. You may say, why is it your, one of your favorites? Because the character, the primary character is an obscure guy, a no-name person, no fancy title. He came out of nothing from nowhere to do something powerful for God. And you know when I read it, every time I read that book, I get fired up because I see what God can do with someone who just gave him his all. And I know that that's encouraging to me, and I'm sure it's going to be encouraging to you. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's stop there. I want you to put on your seat belts. We're going back in time in a time machine. The year is 444 BC. The place is in the city of Susa, which is the southwestern part of Iran today. And where are we in Susa? 
We're in the citadel of Susa, the palace of the king. This is the winter palace of Persian kings. And Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer. That job, it may sound lofty, but when you really probe, it's a scary job. The job of a cupbearer was to sip the wine before the king, king sipped it. Not from the same goblet. The cupbearer would select the wine for the evening, and then he would pour out from the flask wine on his wrist and then sip it. If it was poisoned, he would die, and the king would know, don't drink that wine. So I don't know if you'd want to be a cupbearer because every time the king was thirsty, your life was in jeopardy. You didn't know if you are going to go home that night because someone may have been trying to form a coup and take out the king, and they poisoned the wine. And so the cupbearer's job was not just dangerous. He also became a confidant of the king because the king knew that he, the cupbearer, your life is jeopardized every time I'm thirsty. So who can I confide in? You, because I know that you can, be, you can go out and pass away before I do because you're doing that to make sure I live. So I understand. I can talk to you about secrets. It so happened that 13 years earlier, Ezra the priest had gone to Jerusalem. And he tried to resurrect the idea and rally the people. Let's rebuild the walls. Let's rehang the gates. When the king found out about it, with force and brutality, he squashed that whole initiative. Nehemiah knew about that. And now, 13 years later, he asked about the welfare of the people back home in Jerusalem. Hannah and I said to him, it's not good, Nehemiah. The people are, they're in trouble. And they're in disgrace. In other words, there's a whole lot of shame. Wherever they look, they see the demolished walls of Jerusalem, the great city, the holy city. The place where it was spoken of that if you want to hear from God, go to Jerusalem. The gates are burned with fire. When Nehemiah heard it, it so troubled him that the scripture says that he wept. Now you must understand how Hebrew people wept in that generation. They wept aloud like a child. When a child cries, they bawl. They want everybody to know. People across the street, things are not good. And so they cry loudly. Jeremiah, as a Hebrew man, in order to cry loudly in this Babylonian palace there in Susa, he had to find a private place among the servants' quarters as a servant so that when he cried loudly, it would not disrupt the palace and the equilibrium of the palace. And so he, he scooted away somewhere to some remote section, and then he had to let it out. He had to find some way to release the sense of he felt so bad about what's going on back home. He felt so bad about his people. He felt so bad about their disgrace and the trouble of the lack of walls. You know why walls were so important? It wasn't just walls. Walls protected the city from enemies and predators. Walls also protected the people of the city from wild animals. Walls protected the city in terms of the thinking of the city. The thinking, it, it, it became holistic. Their worldview became centralized when there are walls there. They shared the same thought, the same perspective, the same outlook. But when there were no walls, their thinking became an amalgamation of worldviews. It became so, so, so what's referred to as syncretistic, a bunch of ideas thrown in, a mixture of things. You don't even know what they believe. A little bit of God, a little bit of Babylonian thought, a little bit of God, a little bit of the, the Hittites, a little bit of God, a little bit of the, the Gergeshites. I mean, it became this fusion. And so Nehemiah wept because he realized Polytheism is now invaded Jerusalem, and so they need walls. I want you to know as you go into 2023, there may be a lot of things that have affected you. A lot of things affected you in 2022. But I believe 
that God wants to break off those things and give us a perspective so we can look back at the end of 2023 and say, this is the year it happened. It was in 2023 that I got a breakthrough. It was in 2023 that I got a release. It was in 2023 that I got clarity. It was in 2023 that God brought healing to my family. It was in 2023 that God brought my marriage to a place of wholeness and health. It was in 2023 that my kids caught a hold of Jesus. It was in 2023 that my health took a rebound. It was in 2023 that my wallet and my finances were healed. It was in 2023 my spiritual life took on a new trajectory. 2023 was the year it happened. I want you to know when Nehemiah heard about the devastation of his homeland, it wrecked him. And the Bible is very specific as to the time of the year. It was the month Kislev, which is equivalent to our November, December time frame. November and December are reflective months. We reflect on the past year and we anticipate the new year. And that's right where we are today, isn't that right? And so we're all with this anticipation. We're looking at 2023 and we're saying, God, what's in store for us? But I believe we ought not to just ask that blanket question. There are things we can do to jumpstart 2023 in a way that God wants us to. Rather than sitting back and being this prisoner of hope, let's lean into God and do what Nehemiah did. So first thing Nehemiah did was he boldly approached God's throne. I want you to see, when Nehemiah heard about the devastation, he didn't just say, I, I, I can't do anything. I'm a cupbearer. I don't have any money. I don't have any power. I don't have any people that listen to me. I don't have any rank. I don't, I don't have any contacts or partnerships. I have no alliances that are of powerful people that will just make things happen for me. In fact, my people, they're filled with disgrace and they're in trouble. But I want you to know, Nehemiah realized, though I may not have the remedy for my problem, I know the one who has the remedy. So he, Nehemiah, boldly approached God's throne. I want you to see what the scripture tells us in Hebrews 4.16. It says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I want you to recognize what God is saying. The writer of Hebrews is pointing out by the initiative of the Holy Spirit, the prompting, the impetus of the Spirit, the inspiration of the Spirit, that God invites us to not just come into his throne room and make prayer requests. He invites us to come in boldly. He invites us to be able to come in confidently, valiantly, bravely, and without hes any hesitation. God doesn't want you to walk into his throne room sheepishly with your head hung low like you're unworthy. No, you are a child of the king. And as a child of the king, you walk in boldly into the throne of grace. And God says, this is how I want you to approach me. You may be going through something that's wiser than you. It requires more knowledge than you have. It's more powerful than you. You don't have the wherewithal to accomplish it. But doesn't mean that God doesn't. And so God tells us, you need to come boldly before my throne of grace. And I'm so thankful that's what Nehemiah did. He, this cupbearer, he knew enough that though I may not have what I need, the wisdom, the contacts, the power, the, the, the blessings, the ability, the might, the finances, the resources. I know the one who does. And so Nehemiah boldly entered the throne room of God and said, God, I need your input. In fact, verse 5 makes it very plain to us. Then I prayed this prayer. Lord, God of heaven, you are the great and powerful God. You are the God who keeps his agreement of love with people who love you and obey your commands. This is just the introduction. I encourage you to read the rest of chapter 1. It outlines specifically Nehemiah's prayers. But when you think about it, Nehemiah, he prayed this bold prayer for four months. 
When you look at the month of Kislev, and then you go to chapter 2, month Nisar, four months around March, April of the calendar year. Nehemiah was praying, seeking God, in fasting, in weeping, in, in surrendering to the Lord. This man, he knew that God wants to do something. He did not allow me to hear the devastation of the people back home and for, uh, for me just to weep and just feel sorry for the people. God wants me to do something. And I want to encourage you today that the Holy Spirit is stirring you. He stirring you sometime not by a prophecy sometimes he stirs you by a problem he lets you hear about something that is a problem and instead of you saying oh I feel sorry for them God may be saying to you I want you to do something about this and you may say well God I don't know what to do boldly approach God's throne I want you to go understand what Nehemiah did first thing Nehemiah needed he needed the king to give him clearance to give, him, to give him a leave of absence to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. That's the first need. He needed the king not just to release him to go, but the king to send him. That's different than me going versus me sent by the king who was the most powerful figure on the planet at that time in history. Nehemiah also needed letters that authorized him because when he went to the trans-Euphrates, some 900 miles away, which took three months to get there from Susa to Jerusalem. He needed to deal with the political leaders over there, and they needed to know he was not there on assignment by himself. He needed letters personalized to each of those governors. Nehemiah also said, I, King, I need wood to build a house when I get to Jerusalem. I got to live somewhere while I'm rebuilding the city, and I need wood to rebuild the gates. And wood to frame out where the stones we place to, re, re, to, to, to rebuild the walls. King, when I travel these 900 miles, I need a military delegation so that nobody steals the wood. Nobody kills me. Nobody takes me out. Five things. And then on top of that, God, when I get to Jerusalem, I need the people, the Israelites that are there discouraged, broken down, in disgrace, in trouble. I need them to know that when I'm coming, I have a word from the Lord for them and I need them to rally around the word and be able to help me rebuild the city and not just sit there spectators. I want you to see the big request that Nehemiah had. As to the king giving him leave of absence, yes, God gave him favor. As to the king sending him, yes, God answered his prayer. As to the king giving him wood, yes, God gave him the answer. As to the king being able to write letters, yes, it would happen. As to the king saying, Nehemiah, you're doing this and my assignment is not you, yes. As to favor with the people, yes. I want you to see when you have a big need, realize you have a big God. I'm here to tell you tonight that I don't know what your need may be. I don't know how big it is. I don't know how humongous it is. I don't know. You may look so small and dwarf in the, in the face of your need. You may be fighting a whole city. You may be fighting a whole legal structure. You may be fighting a thing where you feel like you're so dwarf. You're dealing with Goliath and you're David. But I want you to know you're not just David. You're serving the God of David. You're not just minuscule. You're serving the God who says, I will do for you that which is exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask and all that you can imagine. I want you to know you need to then recognize like the, the, great, the great Greek scholar Dr. J.B. Phillips. He says we don't serve a village God. So you need to stop praying village prayers. I want you to understand God will use anybody to get you the answer. God will even use the devil to give you a breakthrough. Our God is so powerful he can do all those things. But you got to realize that. Many of us, we, we, we get to a place, I, I'm tired of being around believers that are so weak. I'm tired about, I'm tired about being around believers that love to worship, but they don't know how to warfare. I don't want to be around believers that all they know how to do is dance, 
but they don't know how to do damage to the powers of darkness. And I'm saying to you, God's raising up a people that are willing to lean in and say, God, do something powerful. And you pray bold prayers and you go before our God and God will do it for you. This is the year that you can look back and say, this is the year it happened. This is the year that I got the breakthrough. This is the year that everything shifted. This is the year that made the difference. Come on, someone give the Lord a battle cry. You must recognize the power of prayer. Don't forget that. Don't overlook it. Just because prayer has been given to you so easily and freely, don't throw it aside. Don't, don't reduce its potency. Nehemiah prayed for four months and God answered every one of his bold prayers to the point where the very king that was instrumental in demolishing Jerusalem is now charging Nehemiah, go back home and you go and rebuild that city. I'm authorizing you to do it. You have this idea? Go and do it. I'm going to give you letters to do it. I'm going to give you wood to do it. I'm going to give you a military delegation to protect you as you go back. Even though the trip takes three months, 900 miles, go and I'm sending you. The very king. It's almost like someone who burned your house down. Comes and says, look, I want to pay for you to have a nicer house. And I want to help you build a house. And I want to have some people protect you so that nobody bothers you when you're building the house. I want to make sure. Can you imagine? That's the God that we serve. The God, God that we serve will even use the devil to bring about your blessings. I mean, there was this woman that she used to pray loud. You ever been around people that pray loud? And you, as, if, as if God's deaf. And you say, come on. It doesn't, you can whisper and God hears you. And she used to live in this apartment complex and she'd pray loud. And the neighbor would just bang on this atheist, live next to her, bang on the wall. Shut up. Shut up. And then sure enough, the woman lost her job one time, and then she ran out of food a couple of months later. And she, every day she's praying, God, send me food. I need groceries, Lord. I need a miracle. The atheist he said, shut up, shut up. I mean, he had no empathy towards this woman. She was just so loud. One day he got sick of hearing this prayer. He said, I'm going to fix this woman. I'm going to go out and buy some groceries just to shut her up. So he went out to the store and he bought two big bag, bags of groceries. And then he came to in front of her apartment door. He put the bags down, knocked on the door, ran into his apartment, and left the door ajar about an inch so he can see what she's going to do. And she looks, she opens the door and doesn't see anybody, looks down. She's shocked. She's two big bags of groceries. She runs in the hallway and starts dancing. The Lord heard my prayers. The Lord's heard my prayers. The atheist got so angry, he said, Look, you crazy lady, the Lord didn't hear any prayers. I bought those bags of groceries. She grabbed the atheist around his arm, started twirling him around and dancing and saying, the Lord answered me, the Lord answered me. He pushed her off and said, get off me. He said, didn't you hear what I said? I said, I bought those bags of groceries. There is no God. I bought the bags of groceries. She ran up to him again, grabbed his arms, continued twirling him around. And he said, you're crazy. And she said, my God is so good, he made the devil buy me groceries. I want you to see God can use anybody, anywhere, anytime to bring answers to our prayers. Our responsibility is to pray bold prayers. Did you get that? This new year, you're going to do what? Pray bold prayers. Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. He rallies the people. They get excited about the idea of building the wall and they get off and they start building the wall. And you know how it is. Every time you start embarking on vision and dreams and goals, there's always some resistance. Always something. It's like when you go to the movies. Everything's going well. The guy got the beautiful girl. He's about to kiss her. And as he leans in to kiss her, you hear the music change. Doom, 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 doom. There's always trouble. You wonder, I thought it was going to be a fairy tale, Hollywood ending, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're changing things. I want to bring you to Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 1. Nehemiah encounters problems. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and insulted and mocked us and laughed at us. And so did his friends and the Samaritan army officers. What does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? He scoffed. 
Do they think they can build the wall in a day if they offer enough sacrifices? And look at those charred stones they're pulling out of the rubbish and using again. Tobiah, who was standing beside him, remarked, if even a fox walked along the top of their wall, it would collapse. I mean, I want you to see what happens whenever you go after big dreams, big goals, big vision, expect criticism. Sanballat was referred to as the governor of Samaria. Tobiah, in the book of Nehemiah, they call him Tobiah the servant, which is a, which is a political title. In other words, he's, he's a servant of the king. But yet for no good reason, these men, they became enemies of Nehemiah and the Jews. And you know, one of the first things enemies do, now Nehemiah was doing something good, rebuilding the wall to create safety and protection, rehanging the gates to ensure that the city you know, has the, its former glory to be restored. Nothing wrong with what he was doing. All of a sudden, he gets assaulted with words, criticism, ridicule, Laughter, condemnation, mockery. I want you to know whenever you deal with that, there's something you must do to protect yourself that you don't become a victim of words that come to criticize and undermine you and riddle you with fear and cripple you where you freeze and never able to fulfill your vision. And look at what Nehemiah did. He puts a shield of courage around his heart. Verse 6 tells us, So we rebuilt the wall. And the entire wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a heart to work. Courage must always conquer criticism. And that's why I want to encourage you. You're going to find your critics in 2023. They're going to assault you with words. You can't go to law school. You, you, can't, you, 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 you can't get married now. You can't start a business, not now. You don't have enough smarts. You don't have enough money. You, you, you don't have enough experience. It's always, you don't have enough. You, you, you're not good at that. You, you should just, just sit back and be happy. You know, there, there, there are always words to come and to undermine and grip your hearts so you never advance, never fulfill vision. I want you to see what Nehemiah did. And that's what we must do. Courageously enter the arena where you fight for your vision. This new year when obstacles come your way and criticism is hurled at you like dynamite and grenades thrown at you, you must be able to battle the criticism by making sure you buttress yourself with courage. See, spectators who are not doing anything, it's easy to throw grenades. Especially we live in a society where people using the internet, they can just say it anonymously. You don't even know who they are. They just tear down and criticize and assault and condemn and mock and laugh and deride and jeer people as we're doing something that's big and something significant. And we must recognize the value of courage when you face criticism. And here's what Nehemiah did. Verse 14, he tells us. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the leaders and the people and said to them, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who's great and glorious. Fight for your friends, your families, and your homes. I want you to see what we must do. If you're going to attain vision, if you're going to see your dreams and your goals realized in 2023 and beyond, you better learn to fight against criticism. You better learn to be able to wage war against that. And to do that, you're entering in. The arena is the place where you do battle. And there are lots of unknowns in the arena. And so when you enter into the arena, that's where you deal with all of the critics and the spectators that watch and they simply you know, sit back and they just try to throw holes and poke holes and throw grenades, all kinds of you know, things at you. You know, in Rome, gladiators, when they went into the Colosseum to fight, they would enter through the tunnel called the Gate of Life. And that gate was 
connected to a tunnel underneath the floor of the, of the arena where they would house these gladiators. And when the gladiators entered into the arena to fight, they would salute the emperor using the Latin phrase, Ave Imperito, Moritori Te Salutant. Which when you translate in English, it means we who are about to die salute you. Now those gladiators were forced to fight. Though we're not forced to fight, when you get a hold of the vision of God, and when the vision of God gets a hold of you, you're forced to fight. If you really have a vision from God, you're not going to lay it down when criticism comes your way. If you really have a word from the Lord, if you're really on assignment from God, then you're not going to give up because people throw words at you and laugh at you and mock you and jeer you. You're going to say, I'm going to do what God's called me to do amidst all of the criticism and the laughter and the mockery and the, and the derision. I'm going to go and do what God's called me to do. I would to God that I'm with people tonight that recognize that when you go into 2023 you're going in with the mindset of a spiritual gladiator you're going into the arena with courage and you're saying God I've come to do your work in 2023 I've come to push vision forward in 2023 I've come to accomplish my assignment in 2023 anybody like that in the room anybody like that here These critics publicly criticized Nehemiah, laughed at him, mocked him. They even said if a fox jumped on the wall. Now a red fox in Middle Eastern society, it weighed anywhere from 7 to 15 pounds. That's the size of a little shih tzu. So you know, you, when we think fox, we think of some big creature. It's not. It's a very small creature. And so... Tobias saying, look, if a fox jumped on the wall, you weighing just seven pounds, the wall, you guys have burnt stone, pulled out of rubbish, it'll just topple over. You know what makes the critics dangerous? Some of what they say is true. It's true that the stones were burnt. It's true that the Jewish people were feeble. It's true that they didn't have all the resources. And though it was like that, it was true. Yet, even though it's true, you still got to courageously enter into the arena. I want you to see how important that is. I remember after President Teddy Roosevelt came out of office, he went on a global tour encouraging people in different countries to do big things and good things to make the world a better place. On April 23rd, 1910, he landed in Paris. And he delivered a speech that was referred to as the citizenship in a republic. Later on, because the speech was so famous, they changed the title to the man in the arena. And what Roosevelt was doing was challenging people to do big things and to do courageous things even though they're critics that try to stop them from doing anything. In fact, the speech went like this. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. This is what Nehemiah was dealing with. He was dealing with the issue of the, how criticism can just grab you and you're the one in the arena. You're the one fighting for your family and fighting for your dreams and fighting for the will of God, but yet the critics are sitting in their comfortable seats as spectators. They're not doing anything. They're not advancing the cause. 
They're not making anything, making society better, but yet they're scoffing and they're throwing words from behind this faceless and nameless positions. And this happens even in the house of the Lord. You know, when I launched this whole next chapter initiative, there's some people that just, you know, they, they without any names, they kept themselves anonymous. This is not going to happen. This can't work. Look at the economy. And I'm saying, if I'm going to try something, I'm going to try it in the face of all the skeptics and all the agnostics and all the individuals who deride because they're doing nothing. And if I'm going to fail, let me fail greatly. I want you to understand, when you move forward to do something, expect criticism. But you as a soldier, you should realize, put courage around your heart. And buttress yourself from the sting of the fear that they try to elicit. Because they're not doing anything. They can pick apart all what you do. And some of the things they say is absolutely right, absolutely correct. But it shouldn't stop you anyway. you got to step in the arena because we need to advance the cause of Christ and advance the kingdom of God no matter how bleak and how bad the world looks. I want you to know this is the kind of believer God wants you to be, for me to be, for us to be. He wants us to be spiritual warriors, gladiators that enter into the arena courageously and do a work for the kingdom of God. Someone give the Lord a battle cry. We have to enter in. And here's what Nehemiah said. The wall in, in Nehemiah 6.15, the wall was finally finished in early September, just 52 days after we had begun. So here he finished it amidst all of the criticizers, all those who were just jeering and mocking and laughing. They weren't doing anything, mind you, but he finished it. May I say to you, you must do the same thing. You must finish your assignment. And that's my final point tonight, is that we must victoriously complete your assignment. There's an assignment with your name on it. I don't know what that assignment is. It may be that marriage that you need to make, that, make it healthy. It may be your relationship with your child. God's challenged you. Make it healthy in 2023. Maybe a career that's been floundering. God's saying, get a promotion this year. It may be a spiritual life that's weak. God's telling you, I want you to be strong. This generation requires you to be strong. I don't know what your assignment is, but all I need to let you know is this. You must victoriously complete your assignment. Can you imagine if Nehemiah went back 900 miles? Take him three months to go back to Susa? And then when the king asks him, what did you do? And he hangs his head and says, well, king, there's some really bad critics over there in Jerusalem, in the area, and they were really assaulting me with their words. And so, king, I couldn't do anything. Nehemiah couldn't say that. All that weeping, all that fasting, all that praying for four months, Nehemiah had to fulfill his assignment. All that mocking, all that laughter, all that just murmuring, complaining about him, all that you know, ridicule, all those insults, there is no way Nehemiah is going to fail. I want you to know you can't go down in 2023. You need to finish your assignment. 2023 must be a year where you said that is the year that it happened. It, I made the turn. I made the transition. I made the, I, I made the shift. My mindset changed. My perspective changed. My disposition changed. I'm no longer a wimp. I'm a warrior. I'm no longer weak. I'm strong. I'm no longer lowly. I'm sitting on top. I'm no longer someone that's struggling in my walk with the Lord. It's vibrant. It's flourishing. It's thriving. I want you to know God is calling each of us to enter into the arena in 20 23 courageously and be victorious for the kingdom of God. Come on, someone give the Lord praise tonight. <laughs> Nehemiah 6 16, Nehemiah said this when all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid. That is, the wall finished in 52 days, and all lost their self confidence. Because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. You're not in this thing by yourself. You're going in 2023 with the Lord with you. 
You're going into 23 with the divine accompaniment of the Holy Spirit. You're going in 2023. You're not isolated. You're not, you're not sitting there bereft of power and strength and contacts and initiative and ability. No, you're going in there. The Lord's going in with you. Just like Nehemiah went to Jerusalem. It wasn't just the military detachment that went with him. It was the fact that the Lord went with him and gave him strength and wisdom and power and initiative and right words, right attitude. And I don't know about you. I'm entering into 2023 with the mindset that says I'm a warrior for Christ. Christ. I'm going in to do battle for the kingdom of God. There's an assignment with my name on it and I must finish it for the glory of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you. 2023 is a year of victory for you. 2023 is a year of victory for us. 2023 is a year of breakthrough for us. 2023 is a year of deliverance for us. You need to know this is your year. Come on, someone shout that unto the Lord. you got to have that mindset. If you don't have that mindset, you'll never accomplish anything for the glory of God. If you don't have the mindset of a gladiator, you'll never go into the arena. If you don't have that mindset, you'll stay back and sit as a spectator. I don't want to sit as a spectator watching others pursue vision, watching others do big things, watching others fulfill dream. I don't want to watch. I want to fulfill my assignment victoriously for the glory of God. I don't want to watch those reality shows. In fact, you need to turn off those reality shows. I don't want to hear about the Kardashians. I don't want to be a hear about Housewives of Potomac. I don't want to hear about Housewives of Atlanta. I want to be able to do something big. I don't need to be entertained by individuals who are not doing anything but complaining and showing off their skin and leaving themselves bare. I don't need to be mesmerized or captivated by individuals that jump from girlfriend to girlfriend, boyfriend to boyfriend, both girlfriend and boyfriend, one to another. I don't need, they're not my role models. I have to do something for the glory of God. I need to enter into the arena and do something great for the glory of God. I need Christ's church to get on fire. I need the Lord to come and fall upon our church that the fire of heaven captures our hearts. Come on, someone give the Lord praise tonight. God's called you. God's called me. God's called us to do something powerful. That's why we entered into this next chapter movement. And I'm inviting you, if you've not been a part of it, you need to be a part of that movement because that's what the church does. When the church is the church, it's salt and light. When the church is a church, it is a healing balm. When the church is a church, it's a restoring gift to the community. And if you're sitting back, a spectator, saying it won't happen, can't go forward, then I'm going to say to you, even if you're right, you're still wrong because it's what the church is supposed to do. Come on, someone, give the Lord praise. All right, guys, there you have it. 2023 it's, is it's here. All, it's a wrap. It's here. It's 2022 a, is gone. 2023 is, is, is here. 2023 is going to be promising, okay? That's right. Just, le just light up the chat, guys. If 2023 is going to be a good year, it's going to be an amazing year. Amazing it's going year. to be much better than 2022, okay? All yeah, right, let's, stand, let's stand together by faith. Exactly. And join our faith mm -hmm. in understanding that God is with us always. And in 2023, he's going to be there with you. Amen. All right, guys. Hope to see you same time, same place next week right here. Yeah. <laughs>